Before Andrew Gardner introduced a recent interview with Barbara Woodhouse, he mentioned that people who take their dogs for walkies in New York are now being encouraged to keep the pavements clean by using a device called a pooper scooper, <laughs> sometimes known as a whoopsie collector. And it occurred to me both those names could describe the function this program performs. Because if you saw the previous two, you'll know that we shovel up what's known in the trade as outtakes, those bits of film or videotape the public aren't usually permitted to see because they reveal some celebrated personality committing what I've previously been allowed to refer to as a cock-up. <laughs> I say previously because it's now been ordained that A, the phrase might be considered indecorous, and B, the plural sounds even worse. <laughs> However, when, uh, when the terrorist organization which controls this station conscripted me to assemble program three, an anthology of the items that went down best in the last couple, I told their hitman I'd only do it on two conditions. One, that I didn't have to make the selection, and two, that we could include some clips that haven't been seen before. So what we are putting before you tonight is not just a rehash, there is some completely new hash. As, for example, a trio of outtakes where Can't Stop the Music suddenly turns into Apocalypse Now. <laughs> so special to the two people because they've opened a door between each other. Every song is a collection of those moments. Time, you found time enough to love. Just a second, Tom, let's do that again. Forget the damn guitar in the left hand. <laughs> You do realise that for an emotionally dedicated singer like John Davidson, the effect of something like that can only be compared to the phone ringing while you're in the middle of a bit of afternoon lovemaking. <laughs> the difficulty isn't just the interruption, it's picking up again exactly where you left off. <laughs> well, those were just a sample of the new clips we've dug up, and we'll be showing you quite a few more later, but first, let's deal with the way we selected the items we're giving a repeat showing. It was done by the method TV people call a vox pop, but elsewhere is known as soliciting. <laughs> in other words, we went out and we stopped people in the street. My own personal favourite was the American pilot. I don't want to give it away, though. Um, aeroplanes, man sitting in an aeroplane, cockpit. Get out of my sky or something like that. The idiot flying the aeroplane with the... <laughs> <laughs> Ice on your wings. It's not so good, Sonny. Not so good. 
You'll lose your head now. Remember what you've been taught. Who the hell is walking across that sky? I can't remember what, exactly what happened. The American army man very fiercely picks up the phone to call headquarters. You understand, Lieutenant, there's an article of war covering your conduct. Sir, but... Not another word. I'll call headquarters. Give me a... <laughs> Colonel, nowadays they use the phone the other way around. Do you remember the bit where, um... The report was interviewing the fella about the aeroplane. Is this a, is this a plane that uh, uh, can run well on one engine? It runs best on one engine. That, that's all it has. <laughs> uh, just for my own crazy reasons, I love the uh, continuity, the man talking about um, within these walls and then the yogurt thing. And later tomorrow evening, there's drama from Stone Park Women's Prison when the inmates start a campaign of violence. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, there was a slight mistake. Within <laughs> these walls tomorrow is a story of Stone Park Prison, the women's prison, in which there's not only women's lib, but there's a lot of danger and a lot of bother. <laughs> and I'm, I'm quite sure that uh, when the governor, there, you can see her, that she's going to be rather cross. <laughs> We're going to show you a bit of the threatened violence that happens tomorrow. And the story is quite exciting. <laughs> Linda Jackson, I think. Where this guy's uh, kissing George Siegel. I mean, giving George Siegel a kiss of life. I was a New York cab driver. I can deliver babies, I can remove bullets, and in a pinch, I could do a little root canal work. Okay, baby. Here we go. It's quite funny when they just couldn't get the words out. Uh, a cowboy uh, outside a prison, I think it was. Hey, you're in a jail. What do you want? I got a message for you, but I don't want to get killed bringing it to. Oh. <laughs> Take 16. Hey, you're in a jail. Yeah, what do you want? I got a message for you, but I don't want to get shot bringing it to you. <laughs> Take 17. Hey, you're in a jail. Yeah, what do you want? Not only a slow learner, but a fast forgetter. <laughs> Actually, the only thing a director can do with an actor like that is take him on one side and leave him there. <laughs> now, in, in, in the course of that market research we conducted about your best liked outtakes, we questioned over 300 people a countrywide survey that took us from Hounslow nearly as far as Wimbledon. <laughs> what I found interesting was the varying degrees of eloquence with which people described their favourite clips. Well, the lady with the swimsuit obviously springs to mind now and again. I like the, old, the bird trying to do the breaststroke and not quite making it. You know, the lady in the swimming costume, when her things fell out. <laughs> the typical one was where a young lady lost the top of her dress. The misplaced boob, you know. I remember that one where uh, little Nell was dancing her tip pops out. And her bra kept falling off and she tried to cover it up. Move your arms and kick your feet to a dog paddle to the splishy
undisputed winner of the World Figure Shaking Championship. <laughs> it's, it's nice to know, sir, that, that, that uh, following our screenings of that clip, not only did her record sales shoot up, but she was offered a very interesting commercial by the people who make super glue. <laughs> but returning to our Vox Pop research, a lot of people told us how much they relish those interviews where the television authority figures suddenly found themselves in the position of being window dressers for an empty shop. An interviewer who was interviewing a Scottish fisherman somewhere north of Aberdeen, and he asked the fisherman a question, perfectly legitimate question in English, which everyone understood. What has been the reaction of most of the people in the fishing industry here to the establishment of the North Sea oil rigs? Well, it's just a little wholeheartedly, guess. <laughs> <laughs> Is there much fear among the people here that the oil may spread and uh, come onto this coastline? Oh, it's, it's burnt off. The wind changes again. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think my favourite, actual favourite of a lot of them, is the Irishman who talks. Couldn't tell what he was talking about, not a single word. He doesn't stop, and the interviewer doesn't say a word, and what he does say is unintelligible. You know, like. I'm from Japan and all this, you know, going on and on. The interviewer is trying like mad to get a word in edgeways. Now, how, ma how many Straban people are employed in the factory? Well, not very many, what's far as I'm looking people all together. My wife's up, is, is, is employed, but I'm not, I'm not employed. And there's a consulate at the side of this point of hall. Yes, you see, in the camera. We've got a, a consulate to ban. Keep your voice down, yes. because the microphone will take it. Yes. Just as yes. you're yes. talking to me now. Yes. Fine. We've got a consulate to ban. Yes. The microphone can get you all yes. right. We've got a consulate to ban. People are born in the town. They don't give out the houses to the, to the people are born in the town. I've been through it several times in the town. I had to go to the minister's storm one. <laughs> Just, yes, just a moment. And there's a leaf work. Just, yes. There's a leaf work, Mr. Ban. And it's supposed to get 13 stamps. And the, the Rick Pierce is saying that the, the, the money's going up every year. The people are born Mr. Banner and time to get the leaf work. When they have to cross the water, they keep two homes. Three men yes. outside the town hall. Yes, here. sir. Yes, three men. But and the only one, George Clinton. 100 people around at the Liberal Exchange. You, yes. don't, you don't seem to be getting much support. Yes, the Liberal Exchange sends, sends the men across the water as born in the town. But they don't send them across the water. And this fact, you lay for two years, the people had to go up and sign on the dotted line on Mr. Ban's soil. Remember that fact that's born Mr. Ban's soil belongs to Mr. Ban's people. Mr. Ban, you're born Mr. Ban. If you're baptized Mr. Ban, tell you're born Mr. Ban. But if you're not born Mr. Ban or baptized, you don't belong to the town. Well-deserved applause for one man's lonely fight against intelligibility. <laughs> you know, we actually, we, we, we put a stopwatch on him. We found he spoke at 92 words a minute <laughs> with gusts up to 120. <laughs> I still think he goes into Swahili there somewhere. But what, what quite a few of our interviewees opted for were those clips that showed people suffering from what you might call the reverse Straban syndrome. In other words, the one where it was the authority figure for whom the pin table of life suddenly started to read tilt. Hello, this is the South Show offices. We work in television studios, of course, and film editing rooms, but this is where most of the work gets done. At the moment, we're setting up films in America. We're doing a film with Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> He's dead. <laughs> But there's one lovely bit in black and white from an old American TV programme, which is live. It's got to have been live because the embarrassed look on the poor woman's face when she's trying to get this guy to put the hoop of flame out. All right, can we get... There we go, we'll put the fire out and you'll see something really exciting. <laughs> Just as it is now. And, um, well, maybe instead of having to do this, 
Maybe the sergeant would come back again a little bit later sometime, and he'd show us some of the other things that the dogs can do. Wait a minute. Let's see if we can try once more, and we'll put the fire out. The one with the kid, the innocent kid. Since you're talking about uh, Grand Prix racing. Right, now it's time for a bite. <coughs> break. But stay tuned <laughs> because we'll be talking to Andy Marriott talking about the South African Grand Prix. <laughs> Grand Prix. Grand Prix. <laughs> yes, Grand Prix. He's got here Grand Prix. <laughs> Well, the snooker one's a great one. I've heard that done with football, but I'm a keen snooker watcher. No, it is behind the pink, but the yellow is on that side cushion. And for those of you in black and white, it's just behind the blue. <laughs> if, uh, if, if puberty is when your body catches up with your mind, what is it when your mind hasn't caught up with your mouth? <laughs> now, of all the responses we got from our survey, the name that people mentioned most admiringly was that of someone who not only contributed more to these programs than anyone else, he made the greatest contribution to every field of entertainment. Best part, I think, was the late Peter Sellers. Really terrific. I thought it was really great. Yeah, Peter you... Sellers. Peter Sellers. Yeah, the Peter Sellers one. The clips from the Pink Panther muck-ups. He was marvellous. He always is. Peter Sellers. Peter Sellers. Peter Sellers. Oh, uh, was there one with Peter Sellers? <laughs> Anyone out there in the pig? <laughs> Don't worry. It's only an old salty Swedish sea dog from. <laughs> <laughs> Special delivery at Ben. Where were you expecting? <laughs> I think like the one where uh, Sellers in the, in the lift, there was retakes in the lift. Yeah. And that to make <laughs> a noise, you know. <laughs> Superb. And suddenly Blake said, oh, stop, stop. I got a great idea. Whilst they're sizing each other up, and one's looking like that, and the other's looking like that, and all this sort of business going, the George Raft routine. Someone should break wind, you see. <laughs> and that would, now they'd all. <laughs> so we said, yeah, but um, if we if we do that, well, what's going to happen? I mean, how are we going to? Oh, we said that's all right. I'll say now. Now. That's what started it. And then Blake said, all right, I won't say now. We said, now is the word that's doing it, Blake. Now is, now is causing the trouble. So he said, all right, okay, I'll make a noise. How's that? Hello? <laughs> 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 
this is a doll. Uh, yes, sir, uh, that is a doll. Yes, I know that, I know that. It's not not, sir. What is this, <laughs> An irreplaceable man. And, and to take us into the break, can I pass on to you a remark Peter made to us while we were showing him certain clips from these programmes? In Hollywood, he said, in Hollywood they say that acting with animals is like playing the drums with two sticks of dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Anna, Timothy, yes, uh, m m most amazing news. <laughs> your, your uncle, your uncle Emlyn, <laughs> your uncle Emlyn has died. Uh, and left you <laughs> yeah, I have a full suspicion. Of that. all over the forest. Mr. Badger helped write them. And now, we'll pick teams of two out of the hat. Really, it's quite amazing the fuss men make over this St. Bruno thing. I mean, all they ever talk about are the cooler, smoother, slower-burning virtues of that mild St. Bruno. Yeah. Sometimes I think they're not really... value for money ain't what it used to be. But just consider your daily painter. That's still worth every penny. One pint still goes a long way and helps to provide the protein, calcium, vitamins and minerals the family needs. Fresh milk. It always has been and always will be. First for value. The only major computer company to put a watch on your wrist. Reliability, quality, value from Casio know-how. Time, date, three-year battery, 895. Time, calendar, stopwatch, alarm, five-year non-stop battery, 1995. Three-in-one, time, stopwatch, calculator, 2495. Casio, what will they think of next? If you're having one of those days when you keep putting your foot in it, what you probably need is a nice cup of fresh brew. Thai Foo's fresh brew tea bags contain only quality leaf tea, so you're always sure of a really refreshing cup. So pick yourself up, enjoy a fresh cup. Thai Foo's fresh brew cup. And start all over again. Fresh brew from Thai Foo. Quality leaf tea in bags. Mummy, can we go to the park? In a minute, Sally, when I finish the shopping. And where are you going today, Sally? Shopping. Shopping by car? No, by post. 
Everyone's shopping by post these days. Especially busy mums. Everyone's shopping by post these days. There was one in the Waltons I thought was quite funny. John Boy in the Waltons, where he cocks up his lines. That unbelievable speech coming out of John Boy's mouth. Mary Ellen, have you gone crazy? Let him down! Why did he come up here? Well, that's no reason to hang him by his balls from a Christmas tree! <laughs> <laughs> hang him by the Christmas... <laughs> See, as I'm living in America at the moment, Ronald Reagan is likely to be our next president, and there's a wonderful clip that you showed of him in an early uh, military film. This is where the Air Forces are fighting. Bases and transport routes in every center of the country. <laughs> the one where the three American guys are standing, talking very seriously. People always talk very seriously before these things go wrong. Ran in two squadrons of bombers, Frankel 111s. Detective cover one squadron and Messerschmitt 110. The time we intercepted them, we were at the limit of our range. Jerry, of course, planning the raid and figured on that. But the result that we just couldn't hang on long enough. I think we got two 110s. I'm not sure, but uh, probably. Oh! <laughs> The barbed wire one, that one, uh -huh. that when they put the Muffet show on by mistake. <laughs> There's a great evening of entertainment this Saturday on London Weekend at 5.15. On the Muppet Show, we're going to have <laughs> music and comedy plus the incredible Mr. Bruce Forsythe. Oh, we ain't got a barrel of <laughs> Show. You did it for revenge. <laughs> uh, that, that, that million to one against sort of foul up, a sudden gremlin within the technical workings of television itself, falls within the category that we privately labelled Logie Baird's Revenge. <laughs> and there's another clip where it cropped up to even more devastating effect. The newscaster. That was funny. The American new newscaster. My favourite was the American newscaster who kept going to items which weren't ready. Over the weekend, Lieutenant General Nguyen Van Tu, chief of state and military candidate for president, finally showed up at a rally with the civilian candidates. That story from Charles Murphy in South Vietnam. <laughs> we'll get that story from Charles not quite ready yet. In the meantime, at the Lake of the Ozarks in Missouri, the sixth annual meeting of the Midwestern Governors Conference opens today. High on the agenda will be such topics as racial violence in the cities and politics 1968. For a report, here is Don Oliver at the conference. Well, we'll have that report. <laughs> This story, I'm sure I can handle myself. <laughs> the so-called torch of peace is moving slowly across the continent from San Francisco this morning in the hands of a relay of runners. It is a peace campaign of a new kind. That story from John Dancy in San Francisco. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> well, I'll that story a little later on. We might be find time for all of these things. <laughs> try for some of these stories now we're ready over the weekend as we told you lieutenant general van tu who is one of the presidential candidates in south vietnam finally started some campaigning with the civilians and here's that story now from charles murphy in south vietnam <laughs> For that particular category of television screw-up, the sort that makes a technical director decide this might be a good moment to have his nervous breakdown, we've got rather a different example of that among our batch of new clips. It happened when a camera crew went out to photograph the complicated aerobatics of a very high-powered model aircraft. And the trouble with high-powered model airplanes, you see, is they do go a bit fast. Out here in the sky, 
studio, I'm with Les Smith, who's from the Model, Air Model Aircraft Club of Liverpool. Is that right, That is Les? correct. That is correct. And yeah. he's got some aircraft over behind us, over there, um, which, if they're ready to take off, are going to do a routine for us. Um... <laughs> oh, oh, dear. There we are. We hit snags there on the runway. There must have been some obstruction on the runway. It looks as like if we may be having a bit of luck with another plane, so let's try again. Here we over are. To you. We've got the second one in the air now. <laughs> These models are travelling at about 90 miles an hour, so it's very difficult to track by camera. I hope our camera's managing to catch sight of that, because it's really worth looking at. <laughs> it's certainly interesting on a place like this, and of course, I wouldn't recommend any youngster to attempt this sort of thing. It's more for the experienced flyer, more certainly. Our normal flying field, incidentally, uh, in Liverpool, is part of the one of the local golf courses where we have <laughs> about five acres of land. I see. Well, <laughs> goes again. And I think that's a loop of the loop up there. <laughs> it's cool when it turns over and over. Yes, the yes, it's a spin. Here we go. He's coming down in a dive. Overhead, straight overhead. Uh, are they sort of actually made on models of a real aeroplane, or...? Uh, this particular one, no. It's uh, purely a, a trainer-type aircraft. OK. Thanks very much indeed, Les. It's very nice to see those, and I'm glad you managed to get them even after... Um... <laughs> That was, the, that was the day when number three camera crew suddenly became an endangered species. <laughs> Talk about endangered species. Our first item in the next batch of clips that you haven't seen before deals with a man who has a very proper concern about the commoner garden tree, because trees are disappearing from our environment so fast, romantic young lovers will soon be forced to carve their initials on parking meters. <laughs> so this gentleman, therefore, made it his mission to go out in the countryside and to plant one new tree every year. Now, he's already planted two near the little Northumberland village of Blanchlands, and this year he's returned to plant his third tree within sight of the other two. Well, we do seem rather to be going round in circles, Mr. No, Goodman. No, no. Um, are you sure you can't remember where you planted well, the trees? Well, I, <laughs> I, mean, I thought it was up that path to the right. Yes, I'm sorry about this. I thought I knew exactly where the darn things were, but uh, I didn't keep a note of exactly where I planted them, and this time I shall remedy the fact. We could have a try up there. That looks quite familiar. No, no, I'm sorry about this. I don't know. <laughs> we could uh, look around at. But do you think we might have a look at the post to ask at the post office? You didn't ask at the post office? No, no, but I met the gentleman there twice, once in 63 and once in 70, and he All might right. have noticed which way I went. <laughs> How does this look? Looks pretty good. Looks pretty good. How about just here? So, I'll start digging. Right. It does seem rather extraordinary that you've come, what, 300 miles and you can't find the trees you've planted. Well, yeah, <laughs> I know. In fact, it's uh, annoying, really, because I thought of everything else. <laughs> uh, it didn't even occur to me. I thought Blanchon's a small place. First of all, you're not... Oh, that's torn it, hasn't it? Hang on, I'm going to try or something. Contestant tonight uh, comes from uh, um, where does he come from? Kidderminster? No, that's the um, no. He comes from Whitstable in Kent. Yes, and um, he's a retired businessman. He's also married, and his name is Ian Webster. And our third contestant tonight comes from Whitstable in Kent, and his name no. He comes from Kent. The other one comes. Ian comes from Kent, and this one comes from Whitstable. Vincent, uh, hello. Oh, that one doesn't ring. I wish you luck, all right. You're going to need it. You wait till your drawers would put holes. Oh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Emery's qualifying round for the Olympic bleeping team. <laughs> well, let's move now.
to one of the most fascinating things that emerged when we went round asking people which clips they remembered best, because it was perhaps most aptly summed up by a gentleman we spoke to round about Berwick Street. I mean, all the things that are, sort of have the, the nasty, bloodthirsty ones. When he was teaching him football, and he turned around to put the ball, and he put it in his stomach. Where Jackie Charlton gets it in the orchestras, because I've always wanted to do that to him myself. <laughs> Come on, let's try a couple. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> There's two Marines unravelling this carpet, this red carpet, which looks like the, the runway at Heathrow. It's about 200 miles long. <laughs> down a corridor and um, they're all, I think it's something like Star Wars and they all tumble out all over the, all over the floor. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure falling out of the back of that van, I think. They were, of course, the professionals, a bunch of actors who make Starsky and Hutch look like hinge and bracket. <laughs> now, if that last batch confirmed a general preference for what that Berwick Street gentleman called all the nasty, bloodthirsty ones, nowhere was that dubious inclination more nakedly revealed than by what proved to be your favourite clip. Ferret, when the guy got bitten by the ferret. Richard Whiteley and the moment when the interviewer turned animal tamer. Sorry, he had some sort of monkey or something like that. Oh, yes, uh, the ferret. <laughs> it certainly made a tremendous impression on me, and that was the one with the ferret. Now, this is really a result of a, of a lifetime of ferreting, as far as you're concerned, isn't it? Mm, I started, I had them first when I was eight. Whereabouts was this? Was this in Yorkshire? Litchfield. Yeah. Ow, ow, ow! <laughs> I'm sorry! Uh, uh... Ow! <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> just hold on to mine. I can't take that, Blake. <laughs> this must be the <laughs> climax of the day. <laughs> if that had meant business, it would have been through to the bone. She's playing with you. <laughs> Just, just to wind this up, let me tell you what followed our showing of that involuntary contribution to the survival series, <laughs> because there were two interesting sequels to it. The first was that in the Guinness Book of Records section covering how long a man can keep a ferret down the front of his trousers, quite a few contestants suddenly lost the will to win. <laughs> and the second was in connection with an interview Kenny Everett did for Yorkshire Television some months later, where fortunately they continued recording after the interview had officially finished. Well, I think we're over in a minute. Anyway. Yes, exactly. Well, listen, they only had three minutes for this interview, so I only had three minutes of questions it's prepared. It's nice to meet you. Probably. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> so I've always wanted to uh, work with you, you know. Have you? Yeah. Well, you've never heard of me before today. I have. You're famous. You know the bit. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Tonight at 9, a former terrorist comes in for scrutiny from CI5. Bring her in. Yes, but remember, no frog marching down the corridors. Just a polite but firm pickup. I told you never to come here. Never. 37 to Alpha. Alpha, come in. There's a friend, a girl. I need some back. Wait. Forget the backup. Do not, repeat, do not move in. Anna says you're allowed to come here as a sleeper. Well, all right, sleeping beauty. It's time to wake up. Hold it! The professionals. The last lot, as BBC.